so uh, this time I get to do one of the talks myself. And uh, as I was saying in the introduction, I think I got the short straw because a lot of uh, IT people think that writing reports is either very uninteresting or even worse than that isn't anything to do with their jobs. Uh, so um, I can well understand that it wasn't the most popular uh, topic to talk about. But um, you know, I've been doing uh, consultancy work now for a mere 34 years. And in that time, a lot of uh, my work has involved writing things. And we're not just talking about consultancy reports. Uh, we're talking about all those other things that you have to write to a good quality. And uh, I've just bunged up on the screen here ones that occurred to me I've had to do. Down the bottom left corner there, the big fat box, that's uh, all the kind of specialist reports that you might think are oh, the job of an IT consultant, like uh, somebody wants to know about uh, the latest ideas for um, cyber security or how to do bring your own device, etc. And if that's your expertise, you may well write that report. The others, I guess, are a more generic. I uh, you know we all have to sell our work. Uh, we do proposals. Um, you might well have to manage the work and do progress reports. So um, hopefully um, uh, you all see that there's a need for being able to write well, whether or not it's a formal report or not. So first thing to think of, um, what is it that you've got to write? And um, very important here that you agree in advance what your client expects. Um, if you're lucky, the client just wants the answer to a question. So it may be all you need to do is to look at the problem and go back and tell them the answer. Maybe a sort of presentation like the girl on the left there is doing. Or alternatively, you might find your client thinks you're going to look at every IT system in their entire organization, assess them all, come up with detailed uh, report on every single facet of the system and turn in a report that's a few thousand pages long, uh, which is the middle one. And uh, then over the right of the picture there, um, this is what IT strategy consultants like to do. They like to spend time um, thinking deeply about your needs and then come uh, back with some fairly um, interesting high level idea about what you might want to do with your IT strategy. and. Um, maybe you can get away with the one page diagram to represent that. But uh, the key point here really is uh, what is it your client expects and what are you going to do for them? So you need to make sure you have discussed that in detail before you do the work. What's it all about? Who are the audience for it? Who wants to know? What detailed information we need? Where does that come from? What are the sources? Um, what is my report going to look like? What's going to be in it? What do you want to know? Um, what kind of format? Is it the one page PowerPoint slide or is it a thousand page report? Um, you might even go as far as uh, I, I think one of our previous speakers was suggesting you actually write the table of contents before you actually write the report. So, you know, this is what the report's going to have in it. Here's the table of contents. Is that what you want? Interesting one there. In whose name will it be published? Is this a report uh, that some external consultant has made, or is this a report which the client organization itself wants to consider is their property? They write it, they sign it off. And, and indeed, who are the people who will sign it off? And where's it going to go to next? How is it going to be published and promoted? So all really important things to have agreed before you do the work. And of course, it makes a big difference to how long the job is and how much you're going to charge them. If it's a really deep, uh, in-depth report to write, it's going to take time, going to take effort. And um, here's an interesting question. I said I'd be looking for some interesting input on the chat. So what do you reckon? If you get to this stage in the process and the client says to you, yeah, and what we want your report to say is that we should do X, Y, and Z. Um, thoughts on that? I don't have an answer myself. I come across this problem from time to time. I'm not very good at, I'm not very good at telling lies. So I um, usually want to be honest. Avoid. Yeah, I like that, Anthony. I would like to avoid. My boss might be a bit upset if I just lost us a million pound contract by saying, no, I don't want to do that. But yeah, avoid's good. 
Um, they got your opinion, um, high level opinion of. They... Uh... So was that somebody talking? If it was, you're very quiet. Oh, sorry. I'll give you a high level opinion. Yes. Um, and then, then, um, uh, well, manage details as they're needed. But yeah, give a, give you a high level opinion of the, what the conclusion should be. That's good. And Enrico says clarify. Okay, that's just a thought. I mean, you, you're probably going to encounter that problem. And um, I remember being very unpopular with one client when I was brought in to do a, a retrospective selection exercise to prove that they had indeed bought the correct software package. And I proved conclusively that they bought the wrong software package, which entirely wasn't what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to prove that they'd done it right. Um, so interesting one. Uh, there's not a good answer to that. Um, if you're going to write a good report, you're going to need good facts. So you'll need to work out who to interview, what documentation to look at. Uh, it might be the sort of scenario where you actually do uh, practical things yourself, like um, collect data, run benchmarks, test stuff out, do a sandbox version of the system, prototype something or other. Um, can't really say unless we know what the challenge is. But what I do know is that you need to work out what those sources are in advance and um, Make sure you've got the evidence that you need to do the work. And uh, it's really important uh, that if you're challenged on your uh, facts or conclusions, that you can actually show the evidence to support why you're saying what you do. It should ideally uh, be cast iron. Uh, and of course, if it's, if it's not cast iron, if it's not certain, then don't stick your neck out and say that, um, uh, pronounce with something where you don't have the evidence. And um, got a really uh, particular care required if you find yourself in the scenario where the IT consultants have been brought in because something has gone wrong. And that's very normal. Um, the most common reason to bring in IT consultants is that you've got a problem. Um, if your in-house developers are getting on fine and nothing's going wrong and you can do everything perfectly, then why do you hire consultants? So we often get brought in if there's a problem. And uh, if it's the sort of problem where something's gone wrong, then anticipate a difficult um, time with the client staff. Um, they won't want you there, particularly if they're feeling guilty about something. You'll see defensive behaviours. You'll find some of them may be dishonest in terms of trying to conceal um, what, what happens. Uh, you'll probably find different people have different opinions about what the problem is, and they're all trying to blame each other. Um, quite normal. And um, you need to be very careful that you get the evidence you need, that you can prove um, anything that you say by way of conclusions. Um, if you find there are conflicting versions of the truth, that's actually good evidence in itself. It's evidence that there's a problem. It's not evidence that one person was right and the other one was wrong. It's an evidence that there's a problem because you've got two parts of this um, operation which are simply disagreeing with each other. Um, and uh, you can anticipate it being quite tough. Um, when we've done this in extremists in the past, I mean, you could well be saying things which will lose people their jobs, even lose the directors their jobs. Um, we've seen that happen. And um, I put in three little case studies for that on the right. These are, these are all real examples from my consulting career. Um, the first one, uh, there was a, um, an air traffic control system uh, not in the UK, uh, I'm not going to tell you which one it was, and their new systems coming in very late, very over budget, and when we interviewed everybody about it, the developer said, the problem is we're swamped with changes. When we talked to their customer, the customer says, oh, there's only been one change, and it was very well handled, happened about six months ago, or something like that. Um, and the reality was that the change control process was not fit for purpose because for them, change control meant renegotiating the contract, lawyers, detailed documentation, uh, business, revisiting the business case. What the developer meant is that a thousand times 
uh, people would come up to them and say, oh, no, it can't quite work like that. You'll have to do it like this. That, that's not going to work. You know, can you change it to do this? No, we need something different here. And so they are plagued with change. One side thought they were plagued with changes. The other side thought changes not an issue at all. Um, yeah, some people lost their jobs on that one. And uh, the next one, international telecoms business. Um, they've got a system developed for them. Those developers have gone away. They had no idea how it worked. Because, oh, IT people, bless them, didn't think it was useful to write documentation. So uh, the client was left not knowing how this system works. So our job is actually to look at the system and tell them how it worked. And when we did that, rather strangely, we discovered that the currency conversion worked the wrong way around. Um, so if you are um, in your billing uh, assuming that, say, $1.3 is worth one pound, the calculation was the other way up, and it set, thought that £1.3 was worth a dollar. What that meant in practice is that a whole bunch of customers um, got their services very cheap and were very happy to put lots of business unprofitably uh, the way of the client. And then another bunch of customers from different countries thought it was horrendously expensive and took their business away. And uh, when we told the finance director that, um, I was here in this meeting, I remember this conversation. He said, it can't be, we'd be bankrupt. They were, they'd run out of business. And um, my uh, track record of killing businesses continued with this uh, non-UK bank. I'm not going to give you any clues as to what, what bank it was, except it wasn't a British bank. Um, they put in a new IT system. And as it, uh, as it was live for some time, they realized that it was calculating everybody's balances wrong. Not a lot wrong. It was only to do with the interest calculations. But basically, um, they had to tell all their customers that not only want the balances correct, but they didn't actually know what the balances should be. And um, we identified problems, we fixed the IT, we put a whole team of admin and accountant people to recalculate the um, customer's balances and get that right. What we couldn't fix was their reputation, shot to pieces. And uh, the result of our work was, yes, we killed a, uh, a bank. So that's uh, the two organizations I've killed in my consulting career. And, um, I think they probably deserved it. So um, you do need very solid ground when you're working at that level. If you are saying things which are life-changing from your client's point of view, um, need really good evidence, and you need to be able to um, pull that evidence out if you're challenged. I know people think it's the content that matters. But if you want to look professional, you really need it to look like a good professional report. So I'm afraid, yes, it does make a difference if it's well written. Um, you need to use good, unambiguous language, standard language, explaining abbreviations and jargons, putting in references, and basically sound like you know what you're talking about. Um, well, that first point there is relevant as well. Um, it's got to be the right kind of language for the type of document it is. So if I was writing a policy document for the civil service to issue to parliament and the general public, it would be very formal language, very well written. Civil service believe you can make great changes happen provided your English is perfect. Um, conversely, if we're talking about the communication to the workforce about what's going to change with their systems, or even the general public in sort of, hey, great new facility coming, the, the bank's now going to do this, that and the other, and you're going to love it. Um, clearly, very, very different forms of language, and it's important you get the style that best suits the needs. And on the subject of ambiguity, um, Here's some examples, which uh, the kind of thing which annoy me. Um, maybe it's just because I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but uh, um, drops is one of my new favourite words to dislike. I uh, don't know if you noticed that um, I think it came from marketing people who keep using the word drop in a way which means something is happening, as opposed to the usual way of using it, which is something not happening. And I've just uh, genuinely cut and pasted four headlines that I saw recently. Um, 
Vodafone drops Wi-Fi coverage. So does that mean that they're doing Wi-Fi coverage or they've stopped doing it? Microsoft drops 64-bit OneDrive. So is that something they're doing or is that something they've stopped doing? Uh, likewise, Microsoft drops IE11. You might know the answer to that if you're a good IT people. And Google drops Android 11 beta 2. Well, I think you need to be an Android geek to know whether that's coming or going. So uh, just an example that yeah, I read these headlines and I think, hey, why, why have they dropped that? And then I realized, no, they, they, they mean they've done it, not that they've dropped it. Um, and I've got some other good examples here. Um, this is a, a senior IT person in Canada uh, told us that they have given their development team their marching orders, which in Canadian apparently meant a good thing, whereas in English it usually means they've been fired. Um, the next one's American versus English take. The, um, if the board has tabled a proposal in England, we mean they are considering it, and if you said that in America, it would mean they're not considering it. Um, words that have awkward different meanings, oversight's a great one. Um, oversight can mean the good process of uh, keeping an eye on things and reviewing them, or it can mean you've made a mistake. Um, strange new language. Uh, how many people know what pseudonymized means? I learned this in 2004. I love the word, but I reckon most people don't know what that means, even though it's appeared on the BBC a few times recently. And if you don't know, look it up later. I'm not going to tell you now. Um, that bottom one, though, um, really need to be careful about this. You often see it in high-level risk registered, and um, people use a form of language such as service provider bankrupt. Now, what I meant when I wrote that probably is there is a very small risk that our service provider could go out of business and therefore we need to have contingency plans for how we might, if we needed to move our business to a different service provider, is what I meant. What the general public's read is, ah, that service provider is bankrupt. This is terrible front page news. Or they might think, well, it, uh, I know it's only a risk register, but it must be pretty likely to be on the risk. So the amount of damage you can do by using language like that in a risk register, um, I've seen uh, some really quite astounding headlines as a result. And uh, the answer is explain it in language which makes it clear that it is an unlikely possibility which is worth considering. Um, so yeah. Uh, don't make it sound like it's present tense. A um, couple of uh, well, favourites over on the other side there. Um, no, nobody, including politicians and people who organise sports events, seem to understand the definition of Great Britain. They're always using it wrongly. Um, we, li uh, we, we live, or at least I live, in a group of islands off the coast of mainland Europe called the British Isles. The largest of one is therefore called Great Britain because it's the largest. That big island is Great Britain. And um, if you meant the territory that the UK Parliament um, rules, you need to say UK. Um, if, like me, you had the misfortune to study constitutional law when you're at university, you realize that it's actually about sort of 20 different concepts of different categories of countries which are either in or out. Are the islands in or out? Are the colonies, the sorts of colonies in or out, etc. Um, and then the last one there, MSP. Um, the normal use of MSP has changed at least four times since I've been using it. Uh, from Microsoft Project, we was abbreviated that, and nowadays apparently it's managed service provider. So um, in the chat, as we're moving on, just drop in the words which really irritate you because they're ambiguous or bad choices of language. Uh, I can see some coming out. I'm not going to read them out now because we need to keep moving, but Keep your eyes on the uh, chats that pop up on your screen and you'll see other people's ideas about uh, bad language to use. Um, quick, uh, quick look at formats you might put your report in. Um, when I say Word and PowerPoint, obviously other software tools are available, uh, but I'm talking more about the style than the actual technology. And um, Word is particularly good at big reports where you need to keep track of um, the content, where you've got tables of content, where you're constantly editing and adding things in again, because it does repagination and cross-referencing very well. And 
if you're good with Word, you can insert lots of uh, stuff into it. Uh, quite popular, however, is to use PowerPoint for the same job um, because people think they can make it prettier with PowerPoint, I guess. And uh, that's much harder to construct a big document, but it does have its advantages. Um, that's when you're printing PowerPoint. Uh, if you're lucky, of course, you might get away with just doing a presentation pack. Great thing about the presentation pack is you don't necessarily need to stick your neck out and actually say anything because you just put the picture up and then when you present to it, maybe you stick your neck out and give some clear advice. But of course it wasn't recorded, so no one will ever prove in court that you said um, that they should or shouldn't do whatever it is they should or shouldn't do. And then, um, of course, very often these days, you're trying to communicate and interact with a wider audience. So it's quite possible the uh, best format to use is actually a web format. So if you're doing a formal report, um, this is an example of the kind of stuff you might want to put in it um, and uh, won't spend a long time on it. Um, if you're doing a small report, it's probably going to be a kind of micro version of this. Key, key points though, um, do put a management summary in for reasons that will become clear when I click next. Um, make sure it's clear what it's about, um, that you said how you did it, uh, presenting your facts and evidence. If you're talking about um, an IT system, very often you'll move on to what the actual requirements are there for, what the options are, maybe there's a business case even, um, and how the client should move forward from that point. If it's relevant to do so, you could also then pack up some of the detailed um, evidence and analysis, et cetera, in its appendices. But it's all going to depend on exactly what kind of report you're doing, of course. Um, I wouldn't normally feel the need to put all the evidence in the report. Uh, this, is, however, is what the client actually reads. Um, very few important people in your client organization will feel it's useful to read all of that report you've just produced and uh, you'll be lucky if uh, they've just taken the time to read the management summary however if they are the top decision maker the overall sponsor of the project you can be pretty much assured that they won't have read anything and that um, you'll um, they will get the message through various informal communications rather than spending time reading your very important report. Important that the report is of good quality. And there's really two sides to that. Uh, on the left, there are things which are to do with making sure that the content is the right content, whether it's what they wanted, uh, whether it's um, intelligent, whether it's uh, got the facts and evidence that show you that the conclusion is the correct conclusion and uh, also bear in mind that as an external advisor to this organization uh, you really need to make sure your position is safe so don't stick your neck out and say things which aren't necessarily correct um, and uh, make sure that when you do say something that you have the evidence to back it up you could find yourself in court does happen over the right, more mechanical kind of checks, uh, make sure your spelling's right, make sure it looks right. Can they actually read it and put in the sort of cross references, table contents, etc., that you need. Um, so um, I would expect you've done that internally before you share it with the client. But really, before you publish, you want the client to say that they accept and agree your report. Um, so you probably will let the client review it um, at a moderately late stage um, to make sure that they're comfortable with what the report's gonna say. Doesn't mean you're letting them change your advice, um, but it does mean that um, they have the opportunity to make sure they're comfortable with it. Um, this is a real example. Uh, it's from a very long time ago and uh, I, I captured this because I was so impressed with my client at this time, um, but I've made it very blurry because I don't want you to be able to read it. The, um, the black test here is the original draft uh, that we um, allowed the top client to review. The red text is all of her changes or comments. So the red is 
um, done by the top client. In this case, um, it was uh, a very senior client. This is a Secretary of State who is uh, reviewing this particular report. Um, and uh, you might think that that's a really bad thing that you've got that many red comments on your draft report. I thought it was wonderful to get that level of engagement, particularly as the Secretary of State in the Government Department is the person whose uh, opinion is paramount. A um, couple of questions there. Um, what happens if the client doesn't agree? And I've got thoughts on that, put them in the chat. And uh, also, how do you get the client to sign off the report? Um, if you ever have a client who just sort of says, oh, I'm not quite sure, I need a bit more here, I'm not quite sure that bit's right there, Can you and never actually wants to sign off, what, what do you do? Um, put your thoughts in the chat and we'll take a look at them later. I'm not going to stop and read them out just now. Um, Style. You can, you can achieve really good style without being some kind of great expert in the tools you're using. Um, this, um, this is a real example. Uh, it's a public domain, so I don't mind sharing this. Um, in fact, I, I didn't have a copy of it. I just downloaded it from the public domain to be able to show you. Um, it's a uh, report um, of the commissioning framework for the NHS. So it's an, uh, a Department of Health uh, report would have gone to Parliament, would have been published um, widely read across the NHS. Um, so take a look at the quality of styling and presentation. First thing to say is it's following style guides that the clients, this is not me trying to be clever. Um, so for example, um, a new section starts on a new page. It has a particularly large uh, font and it's in NHS blue, which if you need to know is Pantone 300. Um, interesting in their style, the section number is actually the smallest uh, font than the text. Uh, and you see the same on the uh, uh, paragraphs here. The, numbering is slightly smaller and slightly different color to the text. Um, little chevrons in NHS blue for bullet points. These are all standard things, as are things like the margins and other style guides, uh, style, style guides for things like um, the um, use of language and so on. Um, over the left here, you can see um, I gave it a, um, a proper index in the PDF version, so you can easily pop down to what you're interested in. Here's a full word from Patricia Hewitt, who was the Secretary of State at the time. And that might look like it takes a high level of effort and expertise, but basically if you're working with a style, uh, a set of styles on your computer, all you need to do is say, this paragraph's a um, 4.1 style paragraph, this is a bullet point paragraph, and it does it for you, magic. So that's the kind of quality I would expect to deliver in terms of the document itself. If it's important report, um, let's make a, a fuss about it as well. So here is a, an entirely different report going out. It is, however, again in the NHS blue, um, but um, this is actually an investigation into um, better working practices in the NHS. Um, not just well packaged in terms of having its own binder and um, having all the contents available in that in those days in CD, but also with a big rollout and speeches and inviting all the relevant people to it. So song and dance. And it isn't, your job's not finished until you've actually got this over to the client um, and to their audience. So you may very well need to look at how you disseminate this content. But having said all of that, I hope that gallop through report writing was more interesting than you expected. Um, we are running a little bit late, so I should probably move us on. Please do drop comments and so on into the chat because we do look at it later and you will see it on the video, particularly if you've got any good things to share.